Hello, my spooky, scary skeletons, and welcome to the final part of me making my Halloween project for this year. Unlike my last video, this will not include much footage of me actually sewing, but rather will focus on showing off the details of this costume and what it looks like as a whole now that it's finished. My last step on the machine was to secure all of the lace in place. Technically, a Victorian lady would not have been caught dead with visible top stitching, but this project had so much lace and was going to have flowers over top of it, so I didn't think that anyone would much mind that there was a little bit of top stitching showing on top of my lace. On top of that, this costume was never intended to be convincingly historical, and in fact was always doomed to never look historical on account of the fact that it is covered in machine lace and black glitter tool, which certainly did not exist during the Victorian era. Once the lace was sewed on, I moved on to my genuine final step with this project, which was to add a lot of fake flowers to accent the Bertha collar and the front of the bodice of this dress. While not entirely historically accurate, I did wear this with an almost complete set of Victorian style undergarments, starting with chemise and a pair of stockings. The skeleton on skeletons is not accurate, but the presence of black stockings for evening wear definitely is. And you may recognize the chemise and the corset cover from videos that I have made in the past when working on this project while I was first brainstorming it. The presence of the corset is also entirely historically accurate, although the specific shape of this corset isn't entirely accurate to the 1860s period. Not only does this help form the body into a smoother shape for the bodice over top of it, it also helps distribute the weight of the skirts and the bust evenly throughout the torso rather than all being focused on the waist. A corset cover was worn over top of the corset to smooth out any lines that may have been created by the corset itself around the bust in order to avoid that sort of bust shelf that you may have noticed if you've ever worn a corset yourself. This corset cover is my own design as well, although it is based off of advertisements for corset covers from the period. The hoop skirt is worn over top of the corset, and then a petticoat is worn over top of the hoops in order to smooth out the silhouette. The petticoat makes sure that no hoops are visible through the fabric of the final skirt layer. In this case, this layer also adds opacity since tulle is, of course, completely see-through. The final step is the gown itself, and this gown is actually in two parts the skirt, which secures with a hook and eye closure at the center back, with ruffles hiding the slit where the skirt meets itself. There is no modesty panel on this, though, as you can see, with the strength of the ruffles, there is really no need for one. And then it was finally time for the bodice. This bodice secures with a row of hooks and eyes at the center back. The most popular method for securing bodices during this time was actually spiral lacing at the center back. However, I honestly just merely didn't trust my ability to get myself into the dress if it had spiral lacing at the center back. So I went for the technically easier hook and eye method for the center back, although you can tell from this video and the fact that I didn't show the whole process of me getting this up, I actually couldn't get it on by myself still. The 
The final touches for this ensemble were also Victorian inspired. While not strictly period, low buns were the look for the 1860s, as were these sort of headpieces with foliage right around the ears. I also added a choker that happened to be in my collection, as well as my glasses because I cannot see without them. Overall, while it's not exactly what I wanted and I can see places where I could improve in the future, I do really love the way this costume turned out. Despite the headaches it gave me when I was making it, it's incredibly fun to wear and it's sparkly and frilly and delicate and a lot of fun to twirl around with, I must admit. Like this video, if you liked this video, leave me a comment down below, perhaps, and subscribe if you would like to see more historically inspired goth frilly weirdness. You can also find links to me on the various social medias in the description box below, as well as a link to join my Discord board, which is not just for costumers or even just for historical people, it's also for artists of all kinds and other sorts of crafters, and we are aggressively positive there. Those are all below if you would like to check them out, otherwise I will leave you with the fancy aesthetic b-roll footage.